So I'll be honest, when it comes to the internet, video games, pop culture, and stuff like that, I kind of live under a rock. In terms of video games, I don't really pay much attention to most stuff that comes out. I just kind of play the very narrow selection of games I'm interested in. I do scroll through Steam, looking for new stuff to play, usually coming away disappointed with how lame everything looks. And more recently, since I have a channel that is sort of devoted to video games, I've tried to become a little more informed. And in terms of pop culture, I've only really heard of celebrities my wife informs me about. Whenever I show my wife a funny TikTok that I saw reposted as a YouTube short, she tells me that she saw it like two years ago. But I don't really feel any sense of FOMO, since every time I find out about some new development in any kind of media or celebrity drama, it's just people being stupid degenerates. And I don't really feel like anyone watches this channel for takes on the newest thing anyway. So this being the case, I literally just found out who the streamer Destiny is. On Twitter I saw a clip of a blue-haired man going on a pseudo-intellectual rant, critiquing Matt Walsh's film, What is a Woman, on a podcast called The Iced Coffee Hour. In order to ensure that this wasn't another two-year-old TikTok situation, I did a Google search to find out it was indeed a recent clip. So now, ladies and gentlemen, or, okay, who am I kidding, you're all dudes. Gentlemen, I present to you a take on recent internet activity. In this clip that I saw, Destiny critiques Walsh's film for supposedly attempting to turn an extremely complex issue into something overly simple. Specifically, his argument is that definitions, like the definition of the word woman, are so complex that it is impossible to provide anything objective and definite. He brings up the example of a chair, saying that what comes to mind is brownness and legs. But some chairs aren't brown. Some have differing quantities of legs, and some, like beanbag chairs, don't even have legs at all. So there's variation and exceptions that don't perfectly adhere to the first mental image that comes to mind when we think of a chair, so therefore it is impossible to have a simple definition of anything at all. Language, for him, consists solely and entirely of mere mental associations, and this is complicated. And because things are complicated, we can just apply language willy-nilly, not ever coming to a sure definition of anything. Now this is precisely the sort of problem I was referring to in my video on William of Ockham with the use of language after nominalism. There was a misunderstanding that was expressed in multiple comments that assumed that I was saying that definitions cannot change as if I was imagining some eternal, unchanging definition of each word in each particular language that is sinfully distorted whenever some natural development of language occurs. This is not at all what I was saying. This misunderstanding actually comes from an inability to think outside of the nominalist framework in which words themselves are identical with the ideas they express. What I am saying instead is that ideas have an objective and unchanging existence apart from the words used to refer to them. When you lose that idea, in which words express truth that has an independent existence rather than words being the sole content of truth itself, then truth becomes something which can easily be obscured by language, rather than revealed and clarified by language. And this obscuring of truth by language is exactly the sort of thing that Destiny is doing in his argument against Walsh's insistence that sex and gender are common sense concepts which one must be either dishonest or a complete idiot to not comprehend. The actual substance of Destiny's argument, put simply, is that the existence of particulars completely obscures and relativizes universals. We cannot simply define the universal of chairness, because there are variations in the particular manifestations of chairness. In other words, because individual chairs all have different non-essential qualities, it is therefore impossible to determine any essential qualities that make a chair a chair. Then he turns to the fallacious argument from the exception, in the instance of a beanbag chair, in an attempt to refute the existence of norms. But of course, he doesn't make this argument in such a direct and clear manner because the faux profundity of his argument depends entirely on obfuscation and verbosity, and ultimately upon the tendency of intellectuals from the Enlightenment onward to treat ignorance as an intellectual virtue. He only sounds profound because he used more words than necessary to simply make the statement that things are too complicated for him to come to any conclusions about anything, and his midwit interviewers are impressed because they just witnessed him use a bunch of words at a rapid pace. This is a prime example of G.K. Chesterton's excellent critique of Enlightenment skepticism and its continual influence on pseudo-intellectuals in his day. He writes, quote, The truth is that the first questions asked by the skeptic sometimes have an air of intelligence, but if the skeptic has no answer, or only a negative answer, the silence that follows soon becomes the very negation of intelligence. A man like Voltaire happened to begin asking questions at a moment when men had forgotten how to answer them. He had immediately behind him nothing but the blind bigotry and brutality of the wars of religion, and he seemed against that darkness a figure of light, 
because he could at least ask a question intelligently. But he and his school seemed to have been quite unaware not only that their questions were as old as the hills, but that the answers were quite as old as the questions. Saints and sages in far-off and even forgotten civilizations had considered these negative problems, and even incorporated them into positive systems. I know of no question that Voltaire asked which St. Thomas Aquinas did not ask before him. Only St. Thomas not only asked but answered the question. When the question merely hung unanswered in the air, in a restless, worldly, and uncontemplative age, there came to be a vague association between wit and that sort of sneering inquiry. In short, there came to be an entirely false association between intelligence and skepticism." End quote. Destiny's critique of a common-sense understanding of the definition of a woman depends entirely on this false association. He asks a bunch of questions which all metaphysical realists have already asked and answered in detail, and is perceived as intelligent not because he has come up with a better answer, but actually because he has no answer at all. In what world is an admission of ignorance, especially regarding philosophical questions so basic and comprehensively answered by past philosophers perceived as a display of intelligence rather than stupidity? Only in a society in which skepticism is accepted blindly for its own sake, usually, if they were completely honest, because it allows them to get away with whatever moral degeneracy they desire, could this pass as intelligence. What it truly is, is ignorance. It is simply an admission that he is a midwit, smart enough to ask questions and to use an abundance of words in rapid succession to do so, yet not smart enough to even begin to answer them. But asking questions is absolutely useless, except maybe to inflate your own ego if you don't intend, or have the mental capacity, to answer them. In vindication of the truth of Chesterton's observation, Aquinas actually did ask the same questions that Destiny asks in this clip, and did indeed answer them, since his goal was the pursuit of truth for the sake of seeking the good, rather than the obscuring of truth in order to justify degeneracy. According to Aquinas, objects have both a substance and accidents. The substance consists of that which is essential to an object being the thing which it is. So, for example, a chair is an object made primarily for the purpose of being sat on. That is the nature or substance of a chair. Its accidents, on the other hand, are those characteristics which are not essential for being the thing that it is. So, for instance, a beanbag chair has no legs and is full of beans, while other chairs might have legs and no beans. But these non-essential elements do not change the fact that it still possesses the essential qualities of chairness that are shared with other chairs. Destiny's argument relies on equivocation between qualities that constitute an object's substance and accidents. He appeals to the existence of accidents in order to argue that there is no common substance that we can observe to form a comprehensive definition of anything, and then he goes into nonsense about language, as if a discussion about how we use words is identical to a discussion about ontology. This collapse of metaphysics into a mere discussion about language is precisely the sort of negative consequences of nominalism I have been trying to point out. If ideas are just words, then words do not actually reveal anything. They only confuse. And as long as we fail to reject nominalism and become metaphysical realists once again, we will continue to regard verbose ignorance as intelligence and fail to come up with answers to even the most basic common-sense questions that make reality intelligible. A woman is a biological female. End of discussion. If your supposed intellectual system cannot make sense of what is common sense even to a child, then it is not actually an intellectual system at all, but rather just overly complicated buffoonery. Return to common sense. Return to observing the world intelligibly. Return to God. Or else you'll wind up with blue hair, speaking convoluted nothingness to impress a couple of midwit podcasters and neckbeard atheists on Reddit, and losing your soul. Anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and all that.